All right. In just one minute, so be, be prepared, because it's coming. What's the deal upstairs? You guys have moved on us. How y'all? All right, Dr. Tebow, who's going to talk in just a minute, said her name was not really like Tim Tebow, except it does sound like that when I say it. So she's going to have to say it, pronounce it for you, so it doesn't have that old southern accent, because that's all I got for you. OK, a little housekeeping. Does everybody know what today's deadline is? I had to write it in my hand to make sure I got it right. The graduation plan is due today. Yay! Because everybody's been there and they've gotten it done. They've seen their advisors. Good to go, right? Yeah. Okay. So good news and bad news. Deadline is today for some instructors. You may have, you may get lucky and have an instructor who says, you can turn it in a little late. You'll be deducted points, but you can turn it in if you want to. Well, if you are a biology major, physics major, psychology major, chemistry major, et cetera, et cetera, we have a deadline. October 14th is the last time we will be doing graduation plans. So if you have not scheduled yours, you need to get it scheduled before October the 14th because we are moving in to advisement time and we can't do four-year plans during advisement time. Okay? Everybody got that? Today's the deadline, but if your instructor says they will accept it late, I don't know, we have some instructors who say, nope, today's the deadline, that's it. And then we have some instructors who will let you have um, a little bit of a leeway with some deducted points. October the 14th is the last time you can get in to get that graduation plan built until next spring. Okay? All right. Kelly Foster, are you in the house? All right, Dr. Ellis, you want to start us? You are next on the list. All right, we are going to begin with psychology. Dr. John Ellis. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. I would have come before if I thought I was going to get the talk on a microphone. I forgot to say go back. Oh. They give you a great go back. <laughs> hey, Martha. Martha, how can how do I get uh, the website up up here? Can you? I think we all have about 15 minutes to talk. I think that's right, right? Um, I'm a clinical psychologist. Who, what are you guys? Are you, are you like beginning students? Have you been students? Or I mean, are you freshmen or senior? Okay, who's freshmen? Oh, okay. So, so um, a lot of. It, are there people who are already psychology majors? Anybody? Nobody. Oh, oh, I see somebody. Yes. Okay. <laughs> But everybody here, it's my understanding you're, you're, you're interested in some kind of health career. Is that right? Is that right? I mean, how many people want to be like, a, a, I don't know, a, a physician? Uh, how, how about a, a nurse? Uh, oh, God, I shouldn't have started this because I'll leave out somebody and your feelings will be hurt. Well, um, uh, there's physical therapy and occupational therapy and speech therapy. And, but who, who thinks they want to work as a psychologist? Okay, maybe, <laughs> okay, yeah. Actually, in our department, starting next fall, we're gonna have a track, it's a pre-med track, because I've been here a pretty long time, and I've had like a gazillion students who wanted to start off in medicine, and they end up in psychology. I think it's because, I think it's because you learn that psychology is a lot more interesting. It's not because it's any, uh, it's not because medicine is harder. I wanted to bring this up. So, you guys, I think a lot of times if you just go online and you look at a department's website and you see what's going on in a department, it can really help you kind of develop the interest that you have. There's all kinds of psychologists. 
there's experimental psychologists, they do all this research and they just teach, and I don't mean just teach, they teach and do research and bring in tons of money, but they're not healthcare providers. I'm a healthcare provider, clinical psychologist. So people like me, or people who are clinical psychologists, we're, we're trained to assess, diagnose, and treat what, what people out there call mental illness, what I like to call psychopathology, or you can call abnormal behavior. It, it's just a lot of fun. I can't imagine doing anything else for a living. It's really fun. Plus, working here is really fun as well, even though I don't usually go, go bucks, but like Martha. Um, who's had a psychology class? Okay, who's had a psychology class beyond intro? Yeah? Like what? What have you had? I'll never hear you. I have two hearing I have two hearing aids. I have them for a reason. So I'll never hear you. But who's had stuff like abnormal psychology? You should take a course, take the intro class, and then take an abnormal psychology class. If that interests you, if no, if that doesn't interest you, then don't go into psychology. Don't go into clinical psychology anyway. That's the stuff that my work is all about. It's about all the stuff that people out there on the streets, it's what they call craziness. It's not really crazy all the time. It's a lot of abnormal stuff, a lot of abnormal behavior, a lot of psychopathology, and how to assess and treat that. I work with lots of different kinds of peoples. I work with people who are, I know, you think I'm gonna fall off the edge. Um, I, work with, I work with people who would experience things like anxiety. Who's ever had anxiety? Who's ever had a fear? Who's ever had stress? Um, yeah, if you haven't done that form that Martha was just talking about, you probably have a stress level. So I work with people who might be people right in here. And you guys aren't experiencing significant psychopathology or abnormal behavior or mental illness. So I work with lots of people who you would never know were seeing somebody like me. People with depression. Have you ever known somebody who was depressed? Have you ever known anybody who was so depressed they had to go to a hospital or they had to see somebody? Have you ever known somebody who was taking a medicine for depression? So I work with lots of people like that as well. But I also work with people on this other end of a continuum who are experience, they're experiencing significant issues in their life. I bet who's heard of things like autism or schizophrenia or bipolar disorder? Who's, who's known somebody who experienced something like schizophrenia? Yeah. Who's known somebody who, like when you were in high, maybe you were in high school or even middle school or, any, or just in your life, who's known somebody who killed him or herself? Yeah. Yeah, we work with, by the way, anybody have an idea how many people kill themselves in this country every year? Anybody know? Somebody say something. Yell, yell it at me. No, how many people? How many total people die from suicide in one year in the United States? What do you think? 3,500. 3,500. Wait. Yeah. Who who thinks they know? Do you you all think something? You, everybody, you smart people. What do you think? What do you think? Say I'm something. Three thousand. Three thousand. Three thousand. Anybody think it's more than three thousand? Yeah. I feel like an auctioneer. What do you think? How many people do you think killed themselves in here? Three hundred thousand. 300,000, 300,000. So we got 3,000, 300,000. 400,000. 400, <laughs> we are doing an auction. Too many. Yeah, somebody said too many, huh? Well, actually it's around 42,000. That's, that's a lot of people, isn't it? Well, we don't work with people who kill themselves, they're dead, but we work with lots of people who think about suicide, who they're, 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 they're at the end of their wits and they can't keep going on. 
So it's a really fulfilling kind of job to work with people that you might be able to help them save their life, or you help save their life. Does, does that sound at all interesting to anybody? That they would work with people and you might have some impact on where they're going. Did you know that many people kill themselves in the United States in a year? And I, I always ask a couple questions in my classes, and one of them is how many people kill themselves, and the answers will range from a couple thousand to a couple million. Can you imagine if a couple million people were killing themselves in a year in the United States? They'd be rolling down the aisle here, there'd be so many people. But tons and tons and tons of people we see who are experiencing way less significant things than that, right? Depression, anxiety, stress, marital problems, problems with their kids, developmental issues. We don't have anybody telling us how long we can talk, do we? Can I answer any questions? I'm, I'm good at running around. If people have questions about psychology, about clinical psychology. Anybody? Is it, any of you, are any of you working with a faculty doing research? Anybody? Okay. Okay. We have a website, it's easy to find. The easiest way to find the website is just to go to etsu.edu and then find psychology. I have a website, every faculty in the department has a website and you can read about our research, read about what we do. You can read about the kinds of peoples that we work with, the kinds of training that's going on in the department. In our apartment we have a PhD program in clinical psychology and a PhD program in experimental psychology where we train people to go out and work in the community. Our clinical psychology PhD program is, is aimed at rural places, at primary care places, so it's, it's settings where psychologists or clinical psychologists work side by side with physicians. Okay, so if you have any questions about psychology or about what we do, or if you think that even interests you in the slightest bit, you should dive into a class and see what it's about. I always think there's two sides to being a psychologist. You have this side over here that's the warm, empathic side, the side that gives unconditional positive regard to people. It's easy to feel for people. You empathize. But this side over here is the curiosity side. So when I see somebody who's acting in a very, very bizarre manner, like there were some people over here who said they had been around somebody who was diagnosed with something like schizophrenia, right? Was it, weren't, weren't there some hands? Schizophrenia is a very bizarre disorder. So if I see somebody and they're talking about people floating in the air or people, people living in their brain or somebody's cut all their hair off and and painted their head purple to keep aliens from withdrawing their thoughts. This side over here goes, holy mackerel, that's, that, that's terrible. It feels so sad. This side over here is the scientist side. This is the side that goes, wow, that's really curiosity arousing. That's the exciting side. You have to have both of those things. I think that's probably true in any area of healthcare. You have to have the curiosity to go with the feeling and compassion and empathy. So you guys want to talk about that anytime you want to read about it, just go to our website, go to my website, go to some of the other faculty's websites and read about what they're doing. Thanks a lot. Good luck to all of you. Thank you. Um, next we're going to have Dr. Luttermoser from the physics department.
This is very odd. I don't understand this. this double I want this to be in the full screen. Okay, it is on the machine. It is on the it's on the machine, yeah. Like it's up here on the screen, you can see it. Here's your... Ah! That, that would teach me to look. Okay, uh, I'm Dr. Don Luttermoser. I'm the chair of physics and astronomy. Professionally, I'm an astrophysicist. Um, but what I want to do is tell you a little bit about our department. So let's get started. Okay. In black out on the button. There's a uh, lower, there you go. Okay. Right side forward, left side back. Okay, got it. All right. So, um, our department offers uh, a major in physics, uh, leading to a Bachelor of Science degree. We don't have a graduate program, we're undergraduate only. We also have a physics minor, an astronomy minor. Uh, we encourage all of our students to get involved with research, um, typically starting in their junior year, but some of our students actually get started in research during their sophomore year as well. Now, because we don't have a lot of majors, we have a very closely knit group of majors who work one-on-one -on -one with our faculty. So that's sort of an advantage for our students. We offer honor and discipline scholarships. We also have something called LEAP scholarships, which uh, students can get a couple thousand dollars um, to use towards their education. And these LEAP scholarships, um, the students take a research methods class in their freshman year. Uh, that helps them learn how to do research. All right, we have a uh, department website. And uh, actually, let me quickly bring that up for a second. So here's our website. And the one thing I encourage you to do is go investigate this. But if you go over to alumni, you can see what all of our students are doing. Yeah. Ah, OK, well, forget about that then. Go to our website, and you can go up to the upper right, uh, and there's an alumni. Uh, pull down menu that you can bring up. And then you can get a listing of what all of our graduates are doing. And there's um, a few that have actually gone on to either pursue degrees in medical physics in graduate school or have gone off to uh, medical school. And the one thing that you should pay attention to is that all of our students who have pursued those career paths have successfully completed those career paths, um, although some, some of our students are still in medical school. Uh, the one thing that um, you should also focus on is that year after year, our majors typically score among the highest in critical thinking skills on the ETSU exit exam. So physics majors learn how to think, and that's very important when you go off to medical school or any of the health sciences uh, graduate programs. Okay, so, um, and because we have a smallish department, our students work very well together. We have a little room in Brown Hall where our majors work together on their, uh, on their homework and, and their research projects. And why isn't that changing? All right, let me, let me change it up here. Yeah, hang on a second. Can you kill this? I don't see the cursor anywhere. Maybe that's why this thing isn't changing. Oh, okay, is that it? All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Don't worry about it. I can control it from here then. Okay. So um, 
What do our graduates do? Um, well, here's a listing of some of our students, what they're doing right now. We have one student who's pursuing a PhD in physics at Harvard, uh, another who's pursuing a degree, a PhD in physics at Wisconsin, a student who's pursuing a degree, a PhD in chemical physics at Maryland, a PhD in physics at University of Washington, PhD in astronomy at the University of North Carolina, and then we've also had students pursue medical physics graduate degrees and also some engineering degrees. Um, when they get through with their graduate level or medical school, they can get very good jobs. Um, one of our uh, graduates is now a scientist at John Hopkins. Um, one is an engineer for a material development um, uh, company. And for health sciences, you see that um, one of our students is a medical physicist at Baylor Healthcare System. Another is a resident physician at the Campbell Clinic for orthopedic surgery. So there's a large range of things you can do with a physics degree. And again, the important thing is that we teach you how to think critically. Um, just to follow up on our main areas of research in our uh, department, uh, we have a few of our faculty are experimental biophysicists. Um, we have a lot of our faculty carry out computational work, computational modeling in material sciences, nanosciences, physics, and astrophysics. And also we have a fair number of astronomers and astrophysicists who also carry out ground-based and space-based observations uh, with various telescopes that the country runs. Um, in terms of our research facilities on campus, we have an observatory. Have any of you been to our observatory? Good, a few of you. Yeah, we have open houses every month when the skies are clear. Uh, you can check out our website to see when those are scheduled. We have dozens of computers that we use in our scientific research and that the students use as well in their research. And we also have a uh, campus planetarium over in Hutchison Hall. Um, and in addition to that, there's also biophysics laboratories. Uh, the two pictures you see on the top on either side are our biophysics laboratories that Dr. Razakowski runs. And our department's also a member of the Southeastern Association for Research and Astronomy, which we call SARA for shorthand. And we have telescopes both at Kitt Peak in Arizona, in Chile, and also in the Canary Islands. So we got telescopes spread across the world in both hemispheres. Um, physics majors work very closely with the faculty and with each other, as I'd mentioned before. And here's a group of our uh, physics majors who went down to the uh, Pisgah Radio Astronomy Observatory down in North Carolina to carry out a research project with Dr. Smith and Dr. Giroux. And as we like to say, physics is fun and astronomy is looking up. So anyway, that's essentially what our department is all about. Do any of you have any questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. how to get control of this again. Yeah, you can kill that. I think you can go ahead and delete that whenever you get a chance. You don't have anything else in you know? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lettermoser. Dr. Tipo from Social Work. Okay, good afternoon. Um, social work is not really known for being very technologically savvy, so bear with me. And 
Okay. Okay, so um, my name is um, Deborah Thibault, or Thibault, the French way of saying that. Uh, and I am a licensed clinical social worker. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about social work in healthcare and also um, the social work department here at ETSU. So, what do you think is the biggest myth about social work or social workers? What do you think of when you hear the word social work? Anybody? Help? Kids? Anything else? CPS, Child Protective Services. That's the biggest myth about social work, is that the majority of social workers are employed in uh, social services or child welfare. And in fact, a lot of the workers that are working for CPS are not necessarily social workers, although some are. So social work, we work in a ver variety of settings. And we work in a, with a variety of populations. So we work at the micro level with individuals. We work um, at a meso level with families or groups. And then at a macro level with agencies or organizations, communities. And um, let's see. I may go back and show this video if we have time. The core values of social work, we value service, being of service to others. Social justice, so one of the things that we do in social work is stand up um, for social justice issues. We honor the dignity and worth of all people and the importance of human relationships. Another core value is integrity. So the work that we do, we're always being honest with our, our clients and upfront about the work that we're doing. And that we operate from a place of competency. So we're never working beyond our skill level. And there's various uh, degrees in social work. You can have an, uh, an undergrad degree, a bachelor's degree in social work. And with that, you would more likely be doing an entry-level type position where you're doing case management for people, care coordination, maybe running a small program for kids or uh, programs at nursing homes, things like that, activities. And then there's a master's degree in social work where you can be trained to do clinical work um, as a therapist or counselor and or also in uh, community organizing. The types of jobs in social work in the healthcare setting, again, uh, case management, care coordination, so working at a um, hospital or primary care office and providing case management to patients. Uh, psychotherapy, if you have your MSW, you can go on to get your license in clinical social work so that you can provide psychotherapy to individuals and families and groups, offering grief counseling, facilitating support groups, and also program development, so administration of programs, grant writing, uh, overseeing agencies or programs. And where can you do social work in the healthcare field? Uh, nursing homes, hospitals, the VA is a big, big one. They hire a lot of social workers. Dialysis centers, health clinics, and primary care offices. And that's becoming really more and more popular in social work called integrated care. So we work very closely as a team with um, doctors, um, psychiatrists, nurses. And in integrated care, again, we're working as a team, focusing on the patient and the family, coordinating services, uh, 
along with the doctors and nurses, uh, emphasizing uh, the empowering clients to make decisions for themselves and for their own care, and paying attention to social determinants of health. So uh, in social work, we're always looking at what are, what are things going on in the person's environment that may be impacting them or their health. Um, let me go back and show this video and then we'll, uh, I'll open it up for questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now where do you need to go? I need to go here and then to that, but then I need to put it on this. And close down the power point. Let's see if you're, if, while you try to figure that out, <laughs> I'll talk a little bit about my role. Uh, so I, I work for the social work department and, and I also work at ETSU Pediatrics providing uh, social work supervision to social work interns there. And my role there is to work with families uh, mostly uh, a lot of work with people who have newborns, and we see a lot of families who um, have um, NAS babies, so babies that are addicted to drugs that come in that we work with, and it's up on the screen. Um, and so one of the things that we do is we talk to them about what kinds of environmental stressors they may have. So we link them to services like food, uh, housing, clothing, all those basic needs. And then maybe link them to uh, mental health services, which some of that we do at the clinic as well. Um, drug and alcohol counseling, uh, things like that. Um, Okay, it's not happening for you. Any questions? ETSU 
social work has an undergrad degree as well as a um, master's degree in social work. And if you graduate from the, the BSW program, you can apply for advanced standing so you can get your master's done in like half the time. It's not happening. Any questions? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Now. On any given day, there are 600,000 professional social workers in the United States who are making a difference. And on any given day, they help millions of people in every walk of life. People struggling with the issues of everyday living, and those who suddenly find themselves facing difficult situations. Social workers help anytime, anywhere, and in some places you might not expect, such as adoption agencies, senior centers, and in hospitals. This is Jennifer Perez. Jennifer is a social worker for the shock trauma unit and the medical unit at the University of North Carolina Hospitals. When it comes to trauma, people are in shock. People are in a fog. They're at a point in their life that they never expected to be, and for some of them, it's the worst day of their entire life. They're thinking, what am I going to do now? And my job is to step in and say, okay, let me try to answer some questions for you. This is what we're going to do, and start the plan and the ball rolling. When her son was in a car accident, Andrea discovered how social workers help. Once I was here, uh, my whole outlook on social work changed. They can give you all you need to know. They are equipped to handle whatever situation. I love helping people at a time where they feel like they cannot find help, and that's where social worker comes in, because we are there to help them in a time where there's no one else that can fill that spot, and that's what we do. While many people have jobs that help those in need, social workers like Jennifer are uniquely qualified for the helping profession. They've earned bachelor's, master's, or doctoral social work degrees, often with additional areas of expertise in cancer care, for example, in crisis intervention, or in counseling. Sue Vatterin is a social worker and a therapist in New York City. How are you? Got your message? Wait, uh, about Marsha. Yeah. Okay, good. We'll talk. Okay. I help people get the symptoms of stress under control and problem solve reasons that they're stressed. A client of Sue's explains the difference a social worker can make. Being a social worker, she really was the only person who could help me to the extent that she has. Social work really pays attention not just to the symptoms and problems that people have, but a lot to the strengths that they've shown in their life that they can bring to bear like a laser on the current problem that they seek my help with. Social workers are trained to look at all the ways an individual may need help, from relationships to resources. Some social workers work for change in society as well, in advocacy, legislation, and in social justice. William Bell is the president and CEO of Casey Family Programs and uses his background as a social worker to address the issues of foster care. Our focus is looking at how do we provide quality foster care, how do we prevent the need for foster care, and how do we improve what's happening with young and young adults who've actually left the foster care system. Casey's programs have changed the lives of thousands of young people, like Angela, a foster care alumna. They were committed, um, and, uh, and it was even more than a commitment to their job. It felt more like a commitment to me. Social work is it's, it's about looking at the social problems, the social issues, and social justice in our society, and creating a space that allows for change. Nothing changes until someone is willing to stand and make a change. And it is time for us to stand and make a change. The world needs social workers because the world needs people who think about solutions from the slice of the human perspective. To feel like you matter to someone that doesn't have to really care, um, you know, is big. 
from one-on-one -on -one counseling to changing society on any given day, social workers help. Anytime, anywhere. You can discover more about how social workers help at helpstartshere.org. Okay, any questions before I pass this on? All right, thank you. I'd just like to remind everyone to remain quiet while there are videos playing and people speaking. Please remain quiet. Someone else is speaking, you're not speaking, okay? Dr. Bidwell from Biology. How is everyone? <laughs> hey, so I'm going to be kind of quick, uh, but if anyone has any questions about biology after I'm done talking, um, we've got a website on the ETSU site under Biological Sciences. And also my office is in Brown Hall 125 across uh, a big display case of skeletons and, stuff and such. So if you, if you want to come and talk, please just, just stop in and we can talk more about biology. How many of you are biology majors? Sweet, very good. Um, biology is a, an, an obvious path into the health sciences. And, a, a good number of our majors are pre-health. And a good number of the doctors that are around in Johnson City now got a biology degree at ETSU. Uh, we've got folks that have gone on to be veterinarians. We've got folks that have gone on to physical therapy and all the various areas in, in health sciences. And I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the, the biology curriculum, which you're probably already starting to get familiar with and some of the opportunities at the upper level in biology. So we've got 19 full-time faculty. We've got one lecturer over in the Kingsport campus. We've got a bunch of, of undergrad majors, almost 600 majors, it's one of the larger departments in the College of Arts and Sciences. We got um, almost 30 master's students and we've got some PhD students who are doing a joint program between biology and biomedical sciences. The program offers different tracks. So you can do biology either with or without a minor. If you do a minor, you take fewer biology courses. If you don't do a minor, you take 50 credits in biology. A lot of pre-health students will do a biology major um, with a health sciences minor, but it doesn't have to be that way, but you do have that option. We also offer a biochemistry concentration, which um, in addition to the basic biology core and the courses that you take in that concentration, you take some advanced chemistry courses. And there are a lot of pre-health majors that do uh, enter into that biochemistry concentration. And then we've also got a secondary education track. The, the core, um, well, the, the, the courses in the core is indicated here. So there are a number of biology core courses. So these are courses you have to take. Biology 1, 2, and 3. Imagine there's a number of you that are in biology 1 now with Dr. Foster. Um, biology 1 is looking at subcellular stuff and biochemistry and photosynthesis. And then you'll take biology 2 with Dr. Hyatt, which starts looking at animals and plants and, and organ systems. And then you'll get into biology three with myself and, and Dr. Jones, depending on the year that you take it. And we'll start talking to you about evolution and ecology. And then you'll also take um, genetics, general genetics as part of the core. And the reason why we've got that set up as a core is we feel that it provides you with a, with a base level of understanding of biology that will that let you then go on and take the upper level courses. In, a, in addition to doing biology, you'll also be picking up chemistry courses and physics and math as well 
as part of your sort of uh, your first years in the program. And then we've got this menu system in biology, which sometimes confuses folks. Uh, but there are four menu areas, and once you've gotten through the core, you'll start taking courses off of these menus. And at the base level, you'll take one course off of each of these menus. And we always get pre-health majors saying, well, why do I have to take a course in biodiversity or population? But a lot of these courses are very relevant to what you'd be doing in a pre-health area. Comparative anatomy, you're gonna start doing dissections on mammalian models, you know, you're gonna be working with cats, which believe it or not, have a lot of the same muscles that humans have. Um, vertebrate embryology, you're gonna be looking at the development of the vertebrate form, including humans. Neurobiology, Dr. Moore teaches neurobiology. You're gonna start looking at the physiology of cells. A lot of the psychology majors take neurobiology. In the population area, ecology, you might think, what do I need to know about ecology? Well, believe it or not, humans are part of the ecosystem. And as a, a health practitioner, understanding where humans fit into the grand scheme of things can be really important. Take ethology, behavior. Right? If you want to go into the behavioral fields, if you want to go into the, into the psychological route. Evolution. Why do you need to worry about evolution as a health practitioner? Any idea? You guys hear me? Why evolution? Have you ever heard of drug resistance? All right, that's evolution and selection and practice. So having an understanding of how that stuff works can actually help in your path as a, a health practitioner. A couple of other menus, biodiversity and the molecular area in the biodiversity space. Uh, general microbiology is a real popular one amongst our health science majors. Vertebrate zoology, right? Understanding vertebrate form and function. You can relate that stuff to human form and function. It actually, in some cases, I had one physician tell me that having taken that course has helped in some diagnoses. So you're getting some basic concepts that you're gonna take on in your career. General entomology. What is entomology? The study of what? Bugs, insects. Why do you need to know that to be a health practitioner? Bugs carry stuff, insects carry stuff. Ever heard of Zika virus? Right, mosquito-borne disease, malaria, mosquito-borne disease. Having some appreciation for the life cycle of these things can actually help in your career as a health practitioner. The molecular menu is probably the favorite of the of the pre-health students. So in this space, you're gonna be doing cell biology, you're gonna be doing biochemistry, hopefully two semesters of biochemistry. Everyone gets concerned about taking biochemistry from the M for the MCAT, but all these other courses that you're taking on this menu are gonna be really part of a good basic foundation as well. One of the great things about biology at ETSU, and, and believe it or not, this is one of the reasons why I, I was working in Australia at the time and I interviewed for the job here and got offered it and moved from the other side of the planet to come to ETSU. And one of the reasons why is the strong undergraduate research program that we have going in biology. There's a lot, lot, lot of opportunity to get involved in undergraduate research. Relatively early in the game as well. And we now have our honors and discipline program back on board, and there are some honors and discipline students that are in the crowd here. And you might think, why do I need to do research? I'm not gonna become a scientist, I wanna become a doctor. Well, it gives you an appreciation for the field. And believe it or not, having a, a research paper, uh, posters, presentations, that type of stuff on your resume can really help when you're applying to medical school. It indicates that you've got a well-rounding as a student. Let me go back on that one. Um, there's a lot of field biologists in the Department of Biology, and, and then there are also lab-based researchers, and sometimes pre-health students think they just have to do lab-based stuff to, to, to get the right kind of research experience, and that's not the case. 
You know, one of the great things about being an undergrad is you can go and, and sample other things. You can go do research on deer or on fish. You don't have to do just medical-based types of research. Although the beauty thing, beautiful thing about ETSU is that with Quillen right nearby, we can actually place students in labs over at Quillen and get them involved in that kind of research. This photo right here actually was taken last Thursday afternoon. It was one of those, I can't believe I get paid for doing this kind of stuff days, where we took off in the afternoon and went to, Gro to uh, Gray Quarry over near Gray, and this is an undergrad student, and we're splashing around in 50 feet of water doing research on zebra mussels over in Gray Quarry. Great opportunity, beautiful water temperature, great clarity. Hard to believe that you're actually diving in, e in East Tennessee. It was like diving in the Caribbean. Beautiful. You can get out in the field and actually do biology, hands-on stuff. Just some examples of some of the projects that our undergraduate students have been involved in. Again, it's not all about just doing medical types of research. You do field biology, you can do botany, you can work on reptiles, there's a whole range of things. It's a great opportunity to get outside the box and do something that you might not have thought about doing before. Right? These are my contact details. As I said, this is going to be kind of short. Um, feel free to email me. Feel free to stop by Brown 125. We can just sit down and talk about the opportunities um, in the area. For those of you who are biology majors, we're really glad to have you on board. For those of you undecided voters, um, we'll help you see the light and get you into biology. So that's it for me. and We'll take any questions you might have. Somebody back there is already clapping, so I better get off the stage. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Scott from Chemistry. I think I'm the last one to speak, right? No. I'm not the last one? I thought I was, okay. Well, what I wanted to do was uh, kind of uh, echo a lot of things that you heard from Dr. Bidwell. Uh, a lot of you who are doing pre-health are most likely taking a lot of uh, beginning science courses like chemistry, physics, and biology. So how many of you are taking chemistry or have had it? Yeah, quite a few people. And um, one of the things that I kind of want to do is start with um, where our department is and what we can do for you in taking these courses. Um, all of our uh, courses and labs are in Brown. The chemistry's main office is on the fourth floor, 469. And uh, right now, uh, we should have everyone who is taking or we should have a picture of everyone in our department at this point. And one of the things that I want to do is emphasize one of the reasons as to why it is that you're taking a lot of these courses, especially being pre-health. And most of the, one of the biggest important reasons is that you're developing a very large, broad knowledge base for everything that you're going to be doing later. And one of the things that that does is it not only helps you uh, develop that knowledge base and have it for later use, but also to become problem solvers. And when you have something that you have to solve, then being able to develop some of those problem solving skills is really important. And uh, our department is here to assist you with that uh, in chemistry. Uh, one of the, some of the 
first questions I get when teaching general chemistry is, are we going to blow something up this semester? Well, the answer is probably not because of a lot of safety reasons, but what you will do is begin developing a lot of that broad knowledge base. And uh, our department is here to help you do that. One of the things that we offer for those taking uh, beginning chemistry is a tutoring center that is uh, staffed by uh, graduate students and they can assist you in doing some of those problems if you uh, run, in, run into those. Um, with that, uh, as you uh, progress through the uh, curriculum towards the end, uh, you can also uh, begin doing undergraduate research with many of the faculty that are in our department. And those can range from positions that can not only um, perhaps pay you throughout the semester or even over the summer, but uh, that can also lead to presentations. Uh, you might have, if you were here last spring, then you might have seen the Appalachian Research Forum that was hosted here at the CULP. And one of the nice benefits of doing research with uh, faculty is that uh, you not only present that work, but you also have a publication with that faculty member, but it's also one great way in which you can obtain someone who has worked with you over two years who can write a letter of reference if you need it. So I think that that is uh, one of the biggest benefits that you can get out of uh, doing undergraduate research with uh, faculty or even faculty in chemistry. You not only develop, uh, develop a rapport with the individual that you're working with, but they can also provide you a wonderful, uh, uh, can, can write you a letter of reference if you need it. Um, as you uh, finish chemistry, there are a, a variety of um, directions that I've seen a lot of students go. Um, I've seen many students go f take their chemistry degree and apply to medical school or dental school or even dental hygiene. And uh, if they don't do that, then they either go on to a master's program or a PhD program in chemistry where they can either work for a university like I did or even uh, go into research or I've seen some uh, work for Eastman. How many of you guys have heard of them nearby? Yeah. So I've seen them go an industry route. Um, a friend of mine I know went to be one of the research scientists for Johnson, Johnson & Johnson. So there are a lot of different directions that the students can go. Right now in our chemistry department, I know that there are about 300 undergraduates who are seeking a bachelor's of science in chemistry. Uh, we also have approximately about 35 graduate students, and most of, them, uh, most of them will obtain their master's and then go on to a PhD program or go into industry or seek some other employment. One of the nice things that I've seen, not only in working here since I've only been here for one year, but one of the nice things that I have seen about students that I have had and students that I have seen uh, leave here this last year is that I've never really seen a student who is uh, left uh, somewhere with either no position to go to or no graduate program to get into. Um, there is a very high placement rate of those who finish with a degree in chemistry. Uh, some people have even told me that the unemployment rate for those who finish with a bachelor's in chemistry is less than 2%. And usually it's less than 2% for some reasons that aren't um, usually discussed. But the point is, is that there's always a very high placement rate uh, in many different areas uh, in leaving with your degree in chemistry. So one thing I want to leave, with you with, leave you with is that uh, our department is here to help. Please take advantage of the tutoring center. Please visit with, the, uh, please visit with us faculty about undergraduate research because uh, we know that we would like having help doing that and we know that we can help you as well. Uh, if you have questions, uh, please let us know. Thank you. And coming up next, we have Dr. Schrift from Anthropology and Sociology.
Hello, everybody. I am Melissa Schrift, and I'm a professor of anthropology. And I also um, have seen many of you because I also work with medical professions, advisement as a faculty liaison, and I'm here to help pre-health students get involved in different activities and to um, mentor you, help you make career decisions, those sorts of things. First of all, I'm actually representing a couple of different things today, um, including sociology and anthropology. I'm going to speak very briefly about sociology. Sociology and anthropology are sister disciplines, essentially. Many of you are now taking or are going to take intro to sociology with Dr. Paul Kmolnik. Um, that's the pre-health intro to sociology. How many of you are taking it now? OK, so a lot of you. So what is sociology? OK, I didn't hear everything, but this. Excellent. Study of social phenomena, the study of, um, I was going to say the study of students. Um, the study of people, societies, and institutions. Why do pre-health students, are, why are pre-health students required to take intro to sociology now? Yeah, because it's on the MCAT along with a lot of different new topics. It's on the MCAT, and so you're learning about um, different kinds of things besides just the natural sciences that have been part of the MCAT for so long. I do want to mention one program in sociology. A lot of people who major in sociology go on to get graduate degrees. Um, many work in nonprofit organizations, do community development work. Um, we have a program that has developed over the last couple of years under Dr. Kelly Foster. And it is the, it's basically the ASRL program, and that's the Applied Social Research Laboratory. And Dr. Kelly Foster does medical sociology, and she also does statistical work. She's one of the best survey researchers in the nation. And her center is actually, they're working on it becoming a center of excellence. She employs a lot of students. They do a lot of health-related work. A lot of her students go on to get a master's degree and then work in the fields of survey research, community health, polling, those sorts of things. If you're interested in sociology, talk to Dr. Kamolnik, come talk to me, check touch base with Dr. Foster, ask her about um, ASRL. Feel free to take a brochure up here. Okay, so the field of anthropology. What do you think of first when you think of anthropology? Humans. Humans? What comes to mind when I tell people that I'm an anthropologist? What do they ask me? We're not going home today if you don't talk to me. What do they ask me? Thank you, Tyler. Um, <laughs> they may ask me a question about evolution. More often than not, they're going to ask me a question about digging or about bones. Most people, when they think of anthropology, think about two subfields of anthropology, and that is archaeology and physical anthropology. Archaeology probably isn't that relevant to most of you, unless in another year you decide you're sick of dissecting cats and you want to do something entirely differently, and you can go and participate in archaeological digs with Dr. J. Franklin. He works in Southeast, Ten or Southeast Appalachia and in different parts of the world. Most of you probably aren't going to go in that direction, but if you do, we have a good archaeology program. Physical anthropology is something that some of you may be interested in. When we talk about physical anthropology, we're talking about the evolution of humans, skeletal remains, 
Um, that's important for the reasons that Dr. Bidwell was talking about, but it's also important for those of you who are interested in forensics. We have forensic anthropology classes, race and human variation classes, fossil classes, all of those you need if you're going to pursue a career in forensics. And Everybody knows what forensics now is now because we see it on TV all the time. Um, what we see on TV actually isn't forensics. Forensics is actually whenever scientists or forensic anthropology is actually whenever scientists work on missing persons cases with police and with the legal system um, to look at, and they look at skeletal remains to try to identify um, humans. Okay, cultural anthropology is what I do, and I'm going to talk about that because that's probably most closely related to some of your interests. I am a cultural anthropologist and I'm also a medical anthropologist, and those are the areas that I teach in. Cultural anthropology is the study of humans, and when we talk about humans, we're usually talking about, well, when we talk about cultural anthropology, we're talking about contemporary human societies. Medical anthropology is the study of illness and healing across cultures. So we're looking at basically how people think about illness, what they think causes illness, what they think cures illness, um, basically looking at their worldview. And I want to talk today about our program in medical anthropology and our minor, and I handed out the placards to you in culture and health. Um, culture and health is a minor developed on the basis of medical anthropology. I don't have a lot of slides, but I have a few. Okay, so this is why medical anthropology, this is why cultural anthropology is important. This is a quote by the AAMC president talking about the fact when explaining the new MCAT that the healthcare system demands a different kind of physician or a different kind of practitioner in general. The way I view anthropology, and particularly medical anthropology, is as a complement to students' trajectory in the healthcare field or as a standalone. We have a lot of anthropology majors that are successful in getting into med school, and then we have a lot of biology majors who minor in culture and health for some of the reasons that we're going to talk about. And again, this is a sort of overall reason. Why are we demanding different kinds of healthcare practitioners today? Give me one reason. Why do you have to be a different kind of doctor, radiologist, nurse, dentist than you did or somebody did 10 years ago? Okay, we can talk about diseases, new diseases. Um, you mentioned change a couple of times, and change is crucial here. Um, whenever we talk about change, we can first talk about culture change. One of the things that we see happening in today's world is that our demographic has changed. Our ethnic and cultural demographic has changed. You're going to deal with patients who do not look and speak and act like the patients of yesteryear. You're going to be dealing with a very different landscape of patients that are heterogeneous. Um, you're going to be dealing with immigrant populations, refugee populations, urban populations, rural populations, rural Appalachians are often considered a distinct cultural group. And so to be a competent physician or to be a competent healthcare practitioner, it is understood that you will apply to medical school with some experience in or knowledge about cultural diversity. 
If you don't have that, you are not going to be competitive. It's a mandate now for anybody practicing in the medical field. And that's one reason we developed the culture and health minor. You can see that reflected on the MCAT, and you can also see that reflected in medical school applications. Other reasons, two other big reasons why I say, and why they say that we need different kinds of physicians, is that we're dealing with different kinds of illnesses. So, for example, we have primarily we're primarily dealing with chronic illnesses today as opposed to acute illnesses. What's an example of a chronic illness? Hepatitis C. Okay, hepatitis C. Why does that require different kinds of care than, I don't know, pneumonia? We've got a very smart student over there. What's your name? Thomas Falk. <laughs> Thomas Falk said because um, it's a lifestyle disease. And that's true with a lot of chronic diseases. They're lifestyle diseases, and they're diseases that aren't necessarily easily fixed. Biomedicine has very little patience with illnesses that aren't easily fixed. They take different kinds of approaches they take different kinds of work to assure compliance. Because they are lifestyle issues, they require um, different kinds of behavior and behavioral changes. So these are very, very different kinds of skills that you're going to need that you don't necessarily get in the natural sciences. One of those primary skills is communication skills doctor or practitioner patient communication skills. A third reason that I'll just mention in terms of a changing healthcare system has to do with health literacy. And we just talked about this in my class, so a lot of you should know the answer to this. Why is health literacy a problem? Or why do we need different kinds of practitioners as a result of health illiteracy? This basically means that some 90% of us don't really understand our doctors when we go to them. Particularly as illnesses become more serious, we understand less and less. Health illiteracy has grown because the medical system has become much more complex. We are dealing with insurance at different levels. We're dealing with new technologies. We're dealing with interdisciplinary teams of doctors that often don't talk to each other. So we have very, very high rates of health illiteracy. Any of you that have spent any time being sick or being with somebody who is sick, you're probably aware of this and the importance of advocacy in that situation. So given this issue of illiteracy, what do practitioners need to have to bridge the gap? Is that Thomas again? Okay. Thomas, thank you. Um, Thomas said we need social skills. Absolutely. We need good doctor patient interaction. Again, it comes back to communication, to education. Not only does this relate to practitioners, but this also opens up a whole new world of. Um, of positions within the healthcare field, and those are in patient advocacy, medical informatics. Um, there's a whole lot of things going on for people who are serving as middlemen and women between doctors and patients. Um, and this is a field actually in culture and health and medical anthropology that we're exploring. A number of our majors go into that who are interested in medicine. All right. I'm not going to talk through all of this. This is a list, again, from the American um, Medical Association talking about the importance of understanding culture in health. 
um, again, part of why you're taking medical sociology. First of all, we know that cultural differences influence how we view illness. Um, Dr. Bidwell was talking about the Zika virus. What is cultural about Zika? I'm working on an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary team over at Quillen on Zika in this region. Why do they want a cultural anthropologist involved? Okay, it affects pregnant women. And what do cultural anthropologists have to do with pregnant women? Huh? Explain it to them. So maybe more kinds of interaction skills. Um, actually, there are a lot of different social components to Zika. And you're halfway correct in that this involves pregnancy. So this involves some real um, basic kinds of social issues, including, for instance, ideas about fertility, ideas about abortion. We see a lot of governments now, for example, internationally, allowing women to have abortions that previously prohibited it. This raises huge ethical questions, as you can imagine. So internationally, that becomes very important. Also, when we talk about Zika, as when we talk about any kind of illness, and particularly infectious disease, what issue gets raised? Yeah, fears about infection, fears about contagion, what we talk about as stigma. And cultural anthropologists are very interested in stigma, particularly as it relates to cultural groups. And one of the things that we see with Zika is that it's going to hit hardest with lower income communities and among different ethnic groups, typically among poor ethnic groups. When that comes into the US, where have we seen Zika hit first? Hmm? Absolutely, warm regions like Florida. What do we see in Florida? Mosquitoes. We see mosquitoes. What else? We see it happening in poorer neighborhoods. What do we see culturally? What do we see ethnically? Vacationers, Vacationers which is an, <laughs> an interesting issue. There are a lot of Latinos in Florida. We have a very large Cuban population in Florida. So the concerns when we get to Johnson City is that we know or we can predict that the first group that will be impacted in Johnson City by Zika are, is going to be the Latino population. So a cultural anthropologist is going to be involved because we're dealing with a different cultural and ethnic group that may have distinct ideas about what causes Zika, um, help seeking behavior, all of those sorts of things. The other issue related to stigma is that in Johnson City, when we identify the fact that Latinos are catching Zika or um, have caught Zika before everybody else, and the headline in the Johnson City press reads, immigrants bring Zika to Tennessee, What's gonna, what are the rest of the people going to th think when they read that? I was gonna make a Trump joke, but I'm not. Because I exercise good judgment. There's gonna be immediate um, stereotypes about different ethnic populations. There's gonna be a lot of stigma involved. And, um, understanding something about information disclosure becomes important then. This is a list um, in an article called The Case for the New MCAT that speaks to the fact that, again, the healthcare field is going to involve, in the next decades, lots of dimensions that we typically don't think of when we think about going into, the me into medicine. This ranges from addiction, 
to patient advocacy, education, spirituality, all, all kinds of different things. I'll also point out that I know many of you come in wanting and expecting to be doctors, but keep in mind too when you look at this list that there are a lot of different fields out there in the healthcare field that can be just as productive um, and just as rewarding as being physicians. Okay. When we talk about medical anthropology, so we're talking about these different fields. We offer the culture and health minor because we attempt to provide interprofessional training. It's an interdisciplinary minor. There it goes. Um, it's an interdisciplinary minor, so you're taking classes from medical anthropology to applied Spanish to spirituality in cultural differences, a class in public health. It's also an experiential minor, and it's a minor that focuses very closely on mentoring and advising. So all of our students, and we have about two dozen now in the first year, all of our students that come and work with me are placed in internships. We talk about strategic planning one-on-one, -on -one, and we work on how to best strategize their careers. We also have provided and we're able to provide more and more different kinds of opportunities for students to go out, get involved, and have things on their resumes that might put you ahead of the game a little bit more. That's it, I think. Questions? Any general questions? You still have one more speaker. OK. Um, come see me if you're interested. And that's it. Leadership. Don't move. All right. Great job. Great place to build from. Thank you. She's right. It's going to take a new kind of healthcare practitioner. So, I'm going to give you a different kind of presentation. No PowerPoint. And the deal is if you will set your technology aside, all your laptops, all your tablets, all your phones, I have a semi short message. There's a handout coming around. It's in two colors. Doesn't matter if you get a blue one or a gold one, as long as you get one. My name is Deborah Harley McClaskey. Dr. Harley is what students call me. We have an interdisciplinary minor in leadership. So let me share a few things that's important to know about leadership. Let's blow a couple of myths. Leadership is just for the elite. Leadership is just to create the CEO or the president or some executive director. How many of you believe that? I am so glad to see no hands up. Leadership is important for everyone, no matter what position you hold in the team. The other thing to understand about leadership is that it is learned. No one is a born leader. It doesn't matter how extroverted or introverted you are. Anyone can learn to be a leader. Now, you may aspire to lead in different ways, and that's quite all right. But leadership in healthcare is critical. She talked about serving on an interdisciplinary team in research. Do you think that the patients you see are only going to interface with you no matter what corner of the healthcare provider you are? Pharmacist, physical therapist, 
nurse, dentist, physician, the list goes on and on. You, as a practitioner, are dependent on each and every one of these individuals. And if you want your patients to get well, it is that collaboration, that partnership, that makes all of you successful. So, on the handout that you got, one side shows the advisement sheet for the minor in leadership. The other side shows a list of 14 questions. I hope you have a pen or a pencil. And I would like to pause for a moment and ask you to just give yourself a score as you answer each of those 14 questions. Can you lead an effective decision-making meeting? Well, what in the heck is an effective meeting? How many of you have ever been to a meeting to make a decision, had the leader come in, hey, I have this idea, I'm really excited about it, what do you think? You sat there and you went, oh, okay, guess my idea doesn't count. Right? Has that ever happened to you? That's, that's not an effective meeting. How do you help everybody's voice get heard? and considered. Can you lead a team to plan and carry out a project and, oh yeah, not do all the work yourself? Oh, gosh, did we not think that was the definition of a leader? The fall person who ended up doing all the stuff? Well, no, that's not what's supposed to happen. So how do you influence the members of your team? And you will have a team. If you're in solo practice, you still have office support. If you're working in a hospital-based environment, goodness gracious, you have an even bigger team. I am a member of the Mountain States Health Alliance Quality Committee. I vote on projects that happen by all of the healthcare professionals in their entire healthcare system. I know a little bit about what happens in healthcare. And those projects are led by everyone. They're not just led by physicians. And if you think you're not going to need to be part of such a program, I can tell you that every hospital in the country is all about quality management. It's all about the team. It's all about influence. And it's all about bringing everybody together to accomplish something new and better. Are you prepared for that? What kinds of courses are you taking to help you improve? Believe me, the skills you have in a student organization are good, but they're not at the level that you need to be out in the workforce. I cannot strongly encourage you enough to think about taking leadership courses or the entire minor in leadership. 21 credits and a portfolio. We even help prepare you for interviews and essays that you need to write to apply for medical school. The courses you take, some students laughingly refer to as the leadership MRI. In other words, who are you? 
and how do you interact with people and how in the world do they see you? What are your strengths and talents? How can you talk about that in an essay and in an interview and still sound humble? We want nothing more than to help you be the most successful health care provider that you can be. I really look forward to meeting with you, to talking to you about this. Just coming to my office doesn't mean you have to commit. It just means you're coming to chat about this. Being a leader in your profession, I think, is what you want, right? Do you want to stay at the low levels? Do you want to progress up? I think that's probably the case. So let's get a step in the right direction and get prepared. I also work with Quillen because guess what? They've started developing leadership programs for their medical students and I'm helping them design them. Why? Because they have folks coming in without this background. Guess how you're going to look when you apply and you have leadership courses in your background or entire minors. I think it's really going to help, and it truly is going to make you a successful provider. So come see me. My contact information is on here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is this is this it for today? All right, guys, thank you for being here. This almost concludes our September 30th Friday seminar. I have one more very important announcement to make. As you all know, registration opens November 14th. That's six weeks away. Seems like a really long time. But in some offices on campus, advisors are already booked up two or three weeks out. So they're booked up until maybe the end of the third week of October. So for registration for the spring semester, now is the time to book that advising appointment with your advisor. So pull out your phones, pull out your laptops. I know you've got them on you. I've seen you working on them today. Make yourself a note in your calendar, in your planner, wherever you remind yourself to do things. First thing Monday morning, you want to call your advisor, email your advisor, sign up on their Sign Up Genius link, and schedule that advisement appointment so that you can register for spring without any delays in November. That's it. We'll see you in class.